This will be the lecture for chapter 15. We'll be talking about the laws of thermodynamics. Essentially, what we're going to be taking a look at is the first law of thermodynamics and how that affects thermodynamic processes. Briefly mention human metabolism. Talk about the second law of thermodynamics and how that's related to heat engines. And then we'll talk about refrigerators, air conditionings, and heat pumps. And kind of finish off chapter 15 by talking about entropy in order to disorder. Won't really discuss these so awful much. So the first law of thermodynamics is really just kind of a conservation of energy type of law. So here I'm going to have my system, and I'm going to say that it has some internal energy associated with it. And I can change that internal energy by either putting some Q or some heat into the system, or the system can also kind of do work. So the change in the internal energy, delta U, is going to be the energy that we add minus the work done by the system on the surroundings. So again, just kind of a conservation of energy. Now keep in mind that the internal energy of the system is going to be related to its temperature. So if it does no work and we add some heat into it, we expect the internal energy, the temperature, to go up. If it, say, does more work than energy that it receives, then the internal energy is going to go down, it's going to cool off. Something to kind of pay very close attention to is positive signs and negative signs. So Q into the system is going to be positive. Q leaving the system is going to be negative. Work done on the system is going to be negative. And work done by the system is going to be positive. That's really kind of defined by that negative sign right here. So a very important thing to keep in mind. We're going to be talking about the first law almost exclusively in terms of gases. However, if you think about it, it really applies to all forms of life. If we have some internal energy of our bodies, that's going to be related to energy into the system, how much we eat, relative to how much we work. If we were to eat more than we were to work, then we're going to start to store that excess thermal energy in the form of fat. If we were to do more work, than we were able to eat, then our internal energy is going to go down, we're going to lose weight, and in a perfect world we would, um, both Q and W would be equal, and we would just kind of maintain our steady body uh, weight. Now let's take a look at several thermodynamic processes and how that's related to the first law of thermodynamics. When I say process, what I mean going from one state to another state. So if we had a movable piston with an ideal gas, it's got some number of moles in there, and we had some initial state, and we said, hey, we're going to compress this gas. Now we've gone from, say, state A to state B, where here we have a different volume, therefore probably a different pressure, possibly a different temperature. When we look at these processes, what we typically do is we typically look at a pressure versus volume chart, or a PV diagram, and what we do is we say, hey, we're going to start off at this state A, and we're going to finish at this state B. Going from state A to state B is a thermodynamic process. We can go between state A and state B in several different ways, and I'll talk about several of those ways. The first way would be an isothermal process, and in this type of process, the temperature does not change. So what that means is the temperature at A must be equal to the temperature at B. Now what we're kind of seeing here is we're plotting pressure versus volume and we can kind of see that as the volume expands the pressure must correspondingly decrease because this guy is going up and this guy is going down and this guy is going to be a constant. Because the temperature at A is equal to the temperature at B we could say hey this side over here is going to be a constant so we could also write the pressure at A multiplied by the volume at A is equal to some constant which is also going to be the pressure at B and the volume at B. Another, another thing to kind of keep in mind is the internal energy of the system. Say for a um, ideal mon or monotonic gas was going to be 3 halves um, nRT. If the temperature does not change, so the change in internal energy is going to be 3 halves nR delta T, if the temperature change is equal to zero, then the change in internal energy must also be equal to zero only for an isothermal process.
thinking about this in the language of the first law of thermodynamics, if the change in internal energy is equal to zero, then the heat into the system must be equal to the work done. Just kind of a side note, in order for an isothermal, again, that means constant temperature, um, process to take place, we just say that it's in contact with a heat reservoir that allows, um, that kind of regulates the temperature of this system. And we pretty much say, in general, the system doesn't fluctuate in temperature, even though in reality it might just a tiny little bit. The next type of process I'll talk about is going to be adiabatic and it's going to look curved on a PV diagram, much like an isothermal did. However, adiabatic actually tends to be a little bit steeper. I won't expect you to be able to recognize the difference between the two. However, one thing to keep in mind is the temperature at A must be equal to the temperature at B for an isothermal. That is not the case for adiabatic. The temperature at C is not going to be equal to the temperature at A in this case. So we can't just do what we did before and said pressure A, volume of A is going to be equal to the pressure at B, volume at B. We cannot do that for adiabatic processes. The nice thing about adiabatic processes, though, is we know that there's no heat flow into or out of the system. So what that kind of says is that Q must be equal to zero, or really kind of Q net, if you will. Since we know the first law of thermodynamics is that the change in internal energy is going to be heat into the system minus the work done, kind of setting that guy equal to zero, that tells us something about the change in internal energy of the system for an adiabatic process is just going to be um, the work done by the system. The other two processes that, that I want to talk about is going to be an isobaric process, or isobaric process that occurs at a constant pressure. So that's going to look like a straight line on a pressure volume diagram. And what we can kind of say here is the pressure at A must be equal to the pressure at B, constant pressure. Because pressure is going to be constant, what we can do is rewrite the ideal gas law to say that the temperature at A divided by the volume at A is going to be pressure divided by NR, which must also be equal to the temperature at B divided by the volume at B. And we can also talk about an isovolumetric process, in which case we're going from A to B. In this case, the volume at A is going to be equal to the volume at B. And I'll leave it up to you to be able to rewrite the ideal gas law to drive an expression similar to this one right here for isovolumetric process. Now, for the first law of thermodynamics, let me just pop over to the next slide and start talking about work. So as advertised, let's talk about the work done for isobaric and isovolumetric processes. It turns out that if the pressure is going to be constant, the work is just going to be the pressure multiplied by the change in volume. So that's going to be for an isobaric process. And so this is going to be pressure multiplied by volume final minus volume initial. Now, because pressure must always be positive, whether we expand or whether we decrease in size is going to depend on whether the work is going to be positive or negative. Essentially, it's going to be negative if the final is smaller than the initial, so the object is being squeezed. It's going to be positive if the gas expands, so the gas is doing work. We can also say that this is actually going to be the area underneath this triangle if we consider the pressure to be just some constant P. And this is going to be some final volume minus the initial volume, so our delta V. So the work done is going to be the area under this graph. And in this case, it's going to be positive going from A to B. For an isovolumetric process, the volume change is equal to 0. So the work done must be equal to 0. So work must be equal to 0 for isovolumetric processes. Now we have our old friend, the first law of thermodynamics, delta U is equal to Q minus W, so that tells us that the change in internal energy uh, must be equal to the heat into the system for isovolumetric processes. Now what we can often do is we can say, hey, you know, we can have multiple processes existing and we can actually have kind of a what we would call a thermodynamic cycle. In this case we would start off say at A and we'd go down an isothermal, um, isothermal expansion to B 
then we would have isobaric compression to D, and then we would have isovolumetric return back to A. You can say, hey, how much work was done? Turns out that's going to be the area under this entire PV curve. So here we're going to kind of work our way kind of like this. And the area under this guy right here is going to be positive. It's going to be the work done by the, uh, work done by the isothermal expansion. And then we're going to kind of come down this way, kind of see that the work done by the isobaric process is going to be negative. So kind of the area, this area right here is going to be the work done um, in the entire cycle. And it's going to be kind of the red minus the blue. Now this slide right here is going to kind of summarize all of the important parts that I've spent the last eight minutes kind of going on about. So you can kind of get the feeling that it's going to be fairly important. I highly recommend just printing it out and having it next to you as you work the problems. Now what is my process? What's going to be a constant? And what does that mean in terms of the um, first law of thermodynam thermodynamics?